Talk about kind of how Hollywood employs their techniques in the cinematics world of uh, games. Um, so I'm a visualization supervisor at the third floor. Been in the industry for about 13, 14 years now. Um, kind of bounce around between feature films and, and games and kind of the, the trailers or um, just kind of like the cinematics promos outside of the in-game cinematics. Um, but it's uh, really interesting how a lot of what we do in the big Hollywood large-scale feature films um, and kind of trim that down, scale it down and do it kind of in a really fast, efficient way for games. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I graduated at Ringling College of Art and Design. Um, do we have any Ringling grads here? All right, we always seem to find each other. <laughs> um, so I went there and um, kind of uh, took a non-traditional path of breaking into the industry before going to Ringling, going into Ringling as kind of a non-traditional student. Um, so I kind of came in with some experience, which was awesome because I could really focus on what I love to do, and that was kind of more the, the animation side of things. Um, during like my junior and senior year, while we we're working kind of in our final projects, um, I was able to partner with Real Effects. At the time, they were working on some Looney Tune shorts. So that was kind of my cutting teeth moment into uh, Hollywood, you could say, those were shown on the, on the big screen, so it was pretty cool to work on some really cool, iconic Warner Brother characters. Um, I kind of found my way, I, mean, I knew eventually I was going to end up in uh, Los Angeles or Hollywood area, and that was always kind of the goal, is to get on the big screen and, you know, get in those big movies, um, and so I got there and it was really cool. Um, fun process along the way, getting to work with some amazing companies and um, kind of found my niche in the visualization world. And so that kind of includes more of the pre-viz side all the way into post-viz. Um, also with some tech viz along the way, but I really found myself enjoying the process of just storytelling and being involved more with full length sequences rather than just individual shots that either build up a beat or um, small section of the stories. So, and kind of a secret if you're in the animation world is you actually, you know, previs always seem like a, a means to an end to get to final animation, but when you're working in previs uh, and the whole visualization process, you kind of get the direct line of communication to the directors and producers and DPs or cinematographers, and it's really special. So I didn't really realize it was like a direct line of communication. You're working directly with these people. And so that was, that was really cool because like the whole process of learning together and learning with them um, and exploring basically what their ideas are in their head and it really just coming out on the big screen Super rewarding, uh, much more rewarding than trying to get the eye blinks just right, which I was in for a while, um, but still really cool as well. Um, so I, I kind of always have uh, enjoyed big, large-scale action films um, and kind of enjoyed kind of the choreographies with certain complex sequences, so complex kind of fight sequences. Uh, more recently, over the past three years, uh, Marvel kind of sunk their teeth in me, so I've been working with them on some of their larger movies that haven't come out yet. Um, but So that's a, it's a little bit about me, um, and I kind of found myself, again, bouncing between either these big movies or some really cool action sequences in games as well. Um, and some of those games include um, Apex Legends. Uh, I was a huge fan of Halo, and so I got to work on Bungie's um, collaboration on Destiny and Destiny 2. Um, and then a really special project that kind of 
I don't even know how it landed on my lap, was with uh, Gears of War 5. Um, and it was just kind of like a trailer promo thing. Um, actually ended up winning some awards, which was, again, like nothing I really would have found myself thinking I was going to be doing, um, but very cool nonetheless. Um, so again, I work for the third floor. Um, I've been with them for about five years. And the third, little bit about the third floor, we are one of the largest uh, visualization studios in the world. And they've really kind of found the specialty in the visualization process. Um, that's kind of really what they've honed in on. So, you know, long story short is like that they are more into the storytelling aspect or how to get the, the vision from the director out onto uh, the, the 3D world most of the time or into, you know, uh, a previous format. And that uh, is really hard sometimes. It's kind of, we, we kind of describe previs as more like the blueprint uh, foundation building for the final look of the film or the game. And they do, they're spread across a whole bunch of different mediums. So you got your film, you got TV and the episodics and the games, the themed entertainment, um, big into the AR and the VR commercials. So a whole bunch of just different mediums that they're spread across. Um, so it's really cool being a part of a studio like this because you can kind of jump around between all these different mediums if you'd like. Um, again, I said I'm kind of a sucker for the big action sequences, so um, kind of gravitate towards those stories. Um, so uh, during that, there's a process that we kind of go through. So the, the whole supervising of visualization includes pretty much all of these processes, sometimes depending on what the project is, just small sections of it. But a lot of times for the bigger, uh, you know, projects um, or projects that need a little bit more help in the development stages, we'll start actually doing everything. So taking a script, breaking it down, going into the storyboard process, creating animatics, going into then the, the previs and the layout. Uh, and that might include working in the virtual production side. If they don't have anything that they, you know, that they, they don't know they needed just a sentence, but that a sentence is supposed to be like a two minute action sequence, we'll do some pitch viz for them, throw some ideas out. Um, so super uh, collaborative, very fun process uh, because we're kind of literally in the creation side with all of the people that are creating this. So. Uh, third floor has been around for over 15 years now, so um, kind of well known in the, the definitely the visualization side of things. And uh, fun little fact is that finally, after all these years, um, the third floor is going to be announcing probably pretty soon, um, more openly, that they're going to move into TTF animation as well. So, um, but. That's a little bit more uh, kind of specialized animation um, where they're kind of taking this virtual production in real time, um, rendering and kind of combining that into an animation pipeline. Um, so this is a little kind of sizzle promo reel for the third floor, just kind of help you see some of the work we've been working on.
Ooh. Some pretty, uh, I'm sure, well-known stuff there. Um, so fun projects that we've been able to be involved in. Um, these are just some of the select game titles that we saw up there. Again, specifically, I was involved in uh, Destiny, Destiny 2, Apex, Legends, and Gears 5. Um, all kind of fun, super fun projects to collaborate with. Um, and so wanted to kind of use Apex Legends as a little case study to kind of show this process of, of how we kind of take some concepts from, from our Hollywood uh, type films and how we kind of take those really just tools and technology into doing it in um, a schedule that is uh, a little bit more appropriate for games and game cinematics. Um, so, but to be honest with you, it's, it's nothing new uh, in terms of uh, storytelling. That's all kind of, kind of still the same as like trying to get that. That's always kind of what we're striving for is like the, the clearest, most compelling, entertaining stories that we can tell. Um, and it's just kind of using kind of tips, tricks, and tools in workflow and, and pipeline to get that all into uh, the story. So Apex Legends, specifically uh, the stories uh, of the Outlands with, with Pathfinder. And um, this one was called Fight Night. So we'll take a quick peek here. This is kind of uh, examples of how our previs looked kind of more in the rougher or kind of some rough stages to the, to the final previs compared to the final um, look of the, of the short. Um, and so this was, the short was about, I believe about seven minutes. And um, so that's it's basically just like a short story. Um, with seven minutes in a sequence that's pretty long, especially even for a feature film, a sequence that's like seven minutes long can be kind of a, a longer kind of intense sequence. Um, so just wanted to kind of share this uh, little segment example here. So you'll notice uh, a lot of the previs looks very similar to the finals. That's kind of our job. Um, we, you know, as, as the visualization process kind of evolves, that's literally the goal. So if you're seeing a one-to-one -one match from the previs to the finals, that's um, because we did our jobs well. That doesn't always happen. Um, and sometimes it uh, is, you know, there's improvements that come out into the finals that um, we did just didn't either have time or there are very small subtleties that, that happen. But uh, for the most part, that's what we're striving for because that's the foundation and definitely the, the core of what the, the final shot's gonna look like. Um, a lot of the, the visualization, the previous side of things is really just getting the approval, to be honest, with like how this shot is gonna be broken down you know, the, the amount of work that's going to go into the finals, the level of effects, the look, the polish, the finish, all that stuff. So um, a lot of that is 
then tied in with the story and the storytelling. So as the story, you know, process, the, the process of telling the story, for it to be very clear, compelling, entertaining, um, fun. So also, um, it, it, so we're gonna kind of go into this like breaking it down a little bit, so kind of get a little bit into the, the nuts and bolts of what this looks like, a little bit more like behind the scenes stuff. Um, but uh, specifically for a lot of these Apex Legends uh, shorts that we did, um, we, direct, we worked with the director, David Lawson, um, and also Alicia Thompson was a, a co-director on it, so kind of just shout out to her as well. Um, super fun, collaborative couple that um, you kind of work with a, a studio that's kind of leading the whole story aspect of it. So in, in this example is uh, the kind of studio that was over everything was EA, uh, and then EA kind of filtered down. And the finals house that third floor collaborated with was The Mill, and The Mill did a lot of the, the actual finals work on these. Um, and so The Mill was really kind of guiding the whole process for previs um, and working, working. So, so I had my team at the third floor and we were working with this uh, creative director. And so the very similar in the Hollywood setup where you're, you know, third floor is kind of contracted to work with a larger studio and the larger studio has a director and then they have their team of producers and you know, creatives that are also making these decisions. So VFX supervisor, editor, and DP. Um, and so that's kind of the, the relationship of kind of how we craft these things. Um, so in, you know, the, again, that's very similar to how we do things in Hollywood and it's just taking uh, their vision and you know, bringing it to life. And so this one specifically was, in the visualization process was uh, well over 200 shots um, and just about seven and a half minute sequence. And so the previs process for this or giving the finals everything that they need, we took, you know, took us about five weeks to do that. So for a seven minute sequence, that's uh, was kind of a lot of shots that were produced over that period of time. So a lot of iterative process and a lot of shot progression along the way. Here's a, um, some stunt viz choreography that was used actually um, to help kind of start the process and um, get the previs actually going. So a lot of times they'll give us maybe a storyboard or something to start with, um, but in order to get really complicated action going pretty quickly, we gotta actually either block things in um, or go into uh, an actual kind of real world setting um, and work with someone who is actually gonna shoot this thing if they, the way that they you know, wanna see it being shot and, and just really kind of get that uh, process, that iterative process going sooner than later. Um, it, it, it's, a lot of it, it has to do with setting up the timing, the pacing, and what exactly we're trying to tell in this, you know, short period of time that this, this action sequence is going. So here's an example of how kind of sometimes stunt viz will come into play and start the, the previs process. So it was, it was uh, really quick. I mean, let me just see if I can play that again and just get the audio here. So you'll see um, there on the left, the storyboards kind of picture in picture with the stunt viz. Um, a lot of times uh, we'll go on set and work with uh, the, if there is a specific choreographer um, that's kind of setting up these, these fight sequences. The director is obviously usually heavily involved, um, but uh, they'll have a, a, you know, the, the stunt choreographer work with the, the stunt actors and they'll just act out these scenes. A lot of that is, um, you know, they have a general idea of how this, the sequence is gonna break down. 
uh, or you know who's going to end up with a weapon or who's going to you know get uh, you know the upper hand or who's going to get beaten up. Um, but along that way, there's a, just a lot of just exploration and experimentation in, in the action. Um, and then the director's job is just how do we shoot that in a really cool, compelling, interesting way. Um, and so during that process, then we see it live most times. And um, you know, a director, if we if they have like a motion capture suit on, um, we're just capturing that motion. We can just throw it on a generic rig, or we can if we have rigs ready to go with the actual characters. That kind of helps the the director sometimes, who's not as familiar with um, in, you know 3D. Uh, can visualize that, um, but it could just very well be, um, uh, you know, real live people, and he's just framing up shots. But passing that into previs, we will then take that data or that motion capture data, or just the reference from that stunt stunt viz, and we'll start creating the previs. So getting the 3D cameras in there, and you know, figuring out the staging, the composition the timing, the pacing, all that fun stuff. Um, but it really is instrumental in uh, building the shots, basically. And a lot of uh, continuity comes into play. A lot of all the, the technical stuff that you, it start, starts to add up to where this is very clear now what this um, you know, action is supposed to tell. Um, action can get really messy, really busy. Um, fun little fact. Um, so David, uh, the, the creative director on this one, we found ourselves kind of in the editing bay, which is pretty common, just they're cutting this. And we both kind of fancy Michael Bay's uh, big action stuff. Um, kind of hard not to, being in loving action. Um, and we just spent like at least 15, 20 minutes quoting The Rock back and forth to each other. It's pretty funny. Um, it was a fun process because we could kind of uh, take, you know, something that, an editing process that can get pretty mundane and um, just kind of keep it real and just have fun ideas and um, try things that I don't think any of us would have been like, let's go from this right from the beginning. But uh, it, it kind of, is it's fun to see how uh, their vision actually evolves along the way. Um, so, Basically, you, I'm sure, without a doubt, you've seen how over this past decade, especially over the past couple of years, how um, all of what we're doing in Hollywood is really combining into video games and vice versa. Um, it's really cool um, to see how the progression goes and um, directing and cinematography uh, kind of being gelled into these games and games kind of becoming a longer form version of a film. Uh, something that I was always interested in in games was the whole story, the whole kit and caboodle of how this beginning, you, you know, start as this character and go all the way to the end in the game and this whole story that evolved along the way. Most films only last like a couple hours unless it's Lord of the Rings, it's like days. But um, you could be immersed in a game for a lot longer than a film. Um, and the more sophisticated storytelling in games are so interesting. And it's, it's not the simplified, just hit you over the head with, you know, this is the story point. This is the, you know, this is what's going to happen. But if you were able to bring in like a film language into these, games and have the opportunity to kind of have like a this idea of showing the audience rather than just telling the audience what they're supposed to know uh, was always kind of interesting to me um, as well as the uh, the same way that a prologue to a film would open up and give you like little hints of what's going to come in the film um, like the uh, opening to seven was like one of my favorite sequences where you get all this like detail about the the killer and stuff in the film. Uh, and it was just really interesting. You get those opportunities uh, more so in games to do in trailers and prologues and, and the cutscenes, of course. Uh, and then, of course, the, the audio you've, you've kind of seen over the you know, past decade, too, is uh, you know, the go-to kind of celebrities or kind of like famous people for voiceovers and you know, have all these 
epic scores that are just so awesome in, in the games. Um, and same thing, you know, that we're creating in, in Hollywood, these really high end type of entertainment opportunities. So that's definitely something that's been coming to the forefront more recently, and it's pretty cool. Here's some uh, just quick examples. So again, you'll see a lot of the previs matching the finals. Um, big part of that is just the timing of um, and the, the staging, the blocking, the composition. So a lot of that uh, is important because once you hand that off to like the finals team, um, it is it's kind of like putting the stamp on it to say, hey, this is basically what we're going to use in the cut for now and move it along to the final piece. Um, and so there, there could be a time where it, you know, usually kind of hands off to the finals. It's pretty rare that it'll come back just because of the schedules. Um, but in, if, if you were doing this in, in Hollywood, the same way that if something isn't quite working or they show a, a test screening to a director and, uh, you know, something about it just isn't right or needs improvement, um, it might come back then for another process or go into reshoots. And so the same thing in games, if something isn't quite right, we need to go back into like even back to like stunt viz or some kind of choreography sequence that isn't quite right um, and uh, kind of redo that section. So it's pretty common. Um, but again, the the end goal is the same is just creating that 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 pro the whole process of making it very clear to the audience and very entertaining at the same time. Um, here's a couple more examples of that. So, the editing is a pretty big part of this whole process, of course. Um, and the same way we kind of do this in Hollywood is we, we kind of start with a huge amount of shots. Um, again, we, in games, you might, the, the, the timeline might just be truncated down a little bit, trimmed down. So, um, you know, there's pluses and minuses to that. The plus side is you can, you know, get to the end result a lot quicker. And it's, um, you know, you don't have to keep drilling on the same shot over and over and over again. Um, but definitely taking advantage of this sandbox approach where you have a lot of content to work with to start building an edit. Um, and, you know, from the very beginning process, we're fleshing out the edit. That's kind of like our, um, you know, master reference that we're always going back to is, um, build just building this edit on top of each other so a lot of times an edit may even just start with words and that's timed out to a soundtrack or some you know voices and or quickly evolve into storyboards or some concept art artwork um, and then once we get into adding motion to it that is obviously starting to flesh out more of the timing the staging the compositions of all these shots um, but Basically, it's it's just fleshing out the whole sequence as a, you know as a whole because we keep looking at everything as a whole and you start breaking that whole sequence down into into beats and shots um, and so pretty much the final cut uh, of this then is handed off to the finals to finish and a lot of the times we sup, you know supply all of the a lot of the 3D files so again that's like a huge heavy lifting in terms of starting the shot. Um, even with, if we're using motion capture data that we kind of start with as temp motion capture data, um, sometimes uh, it's good enough to actually make into finals or we have cleaned it up enough to where uh, if it's in game, they just use it for finals. So that data can sometimes go through. Sometimes they'll end up taking um, you know, the time to actually do a, a lot more complicated uh, motion capture shoot. Um, and so some fun 
opportunities come up. If, if you need motion capture, you need to tell like action on the fly. Sometimes we'll, as animators, we'll get into the suits and act some of these things out um, and take that animation, add it to these characters. And every once in a while, you could be a character in a game and get all the way to the finals. Um, and that would be you up on the screen. So it's, it's a cool, uh, it's a fun little aspect to the visualization process as well. Um, and, uh, you know, another kind of fun process too that is again, like working, working with all these different types of directors, um, you have the, you have the ability to just kind of spitball ideas and um, really take uh, you know the essence of what they're trying to to tell the audience and uh, either enhance it or you know maybe something the director might not have have thought of that you can add to um, or you know you you come up with ideas or your team comes up with ideas and it gets the director all excited to kind of take that idea and you know turn it into something different so there's all these uh, alternate shots that come up along the way um, and that's uh, honestly, that's like one of the most fun processes is, is to just, um, you know, have the director say, hey, we trust you, just, just you know, do something really cool with this sequence. And it's really rewarding um, to, to have that opportunity because you're uh, literally influencing the final look of the film. Um, a lot of final vendors or VFX um, houses kind of sometimes get a little upset at third floor uh, just because it's the director producers are always just like, just match the previs, just match the previs. And so it's, it's hard for them to get as creative when we have it all worked out. Um, but again, that's, that's literally our, our jobs is to, to do that. So once it gets to the finals, it becomes a lot more streamlined, straightforward uh, to finish. Um, to be honest, that's a lot of money saved in the end. Because um, if you're trying to figure all that out in finals, it's usually going to cost a lot more. Um, and it also can lower the quality because if you're not able to iterate as fast and you're not able to get, um, you know, like interesting, compelling stuff that the director actually wants and you're kind of just having to pick away at little things along the way, it, it ends up costing more money. Um, and so that's, that's literally our job is to try to get it to the finals as quickly as possible. So here's some all just alt shots, alternative shots, um, examples of kind of just showing the iterative process. There was obviously way more than three versions of that, um, but that was just kind of an example of kind of how shot progression can can take place. Um, and you know, you kind of saw the first version as more like the vanilla version of this is the idea, right? So the Pathfinder is just shooting his grappling hook out to kind of save himself from falling off the ship, and it slowly just involved uh, in you know the camera to kind of work with the action and the motion to to rotate and tilt. Um, and so that was uh, kind of a small example of how uh, a simple kind of shot idea progressed um, into something a little bit more interesting and entertaining, um, especially involving the, the grappling hook. Um, here's another example. So again, a lot of subtleties in this, um, but kind of necessary in a way for it to be clear uh, and arguably better. 
Um, so just small tweaks to how uh, the robot is going to attack from a punch to a kick, the timing, the slight angles of the camera, um, and you know, basically how to set that idea up for the kind of um, the, the best way to tell that part of the story. Um, but that's, those are small examples of, of how things um, can get worked out in the, the, the progression of the shot. Um, I mean, again, it kind of just goes back down to what the original idea was, the storyboard, most cases, and getting it into 3D. Uh, once you get into 3D, a lot of, um, you know, the, the real technical issues of the clarity starts to get worked out just naturally because you need to have a camera that has a, you know, lensing on it. Um, and, you know, in order to, to have that uh, story make sense in depth, um, all those, all those uh, technical aspects just come into play. Um, and so here's another example of that. So again, this, this one took a lot more than four versions, but um, you could see how the camera kind of started off flying down into showing this idea that the robot's climbing back up the ship um, and um, kind of showing you know, the state of Pathfinder and uh, turned into a little bit more interesting shot where it was kind of the camera starting low, low angle, um, good angle kind of staging to show how the, the robot's coming up over the side of the ship. Uh, robot kind of leaned over and setting up a little bit more interesting like foreground, middle ground, background to kind of tell that story. Um, so that, that was basically just small examples of what we're doing um, with the director to um, make the story better. Um, but in specifically taking you know this concept that a lot of what we're doing in, in film and attaching it into more of the, the game side. Um, you know, you'll, we, we've seen this uh, just over this course of uh, the year, couple of years here now with um, all these new tools that are coming out, all of the, the real-time rendering, um, obviously the high def, the graphics, the graphics are just getting insane. So a lot of all these things are just kind of advancing what we're doing, just tools to make our jobs easier. Um, and it's, at the end of the day, it's, it's really just about the entertainment side of things, is how do we get the, the level of entertainment, the quality of entertainment to the next level. Um, and all these advances that are happening seem to be colliding with each other constantly. Um, and you know, being able to leverage real time, uh, you know, software like Unreal and um, you know, Epic, uh, game stuff that they're, they're using uh, as well as Unity. Uh, so like having these tools to be able to kind of see more of a finals look stuff earlier on is always uh, an advantage. And so we're able to leverage those the same way we are in like a, a virtual art department for uh, Hollywood. Um, and uh, it's, it, again, it's very, it's, it's awesome to be in this era right now for um, having this the, the combination this back and forth between you know storytelling in Hollywood and and technology and stuff in games and um, having all of that just combine with each other and then you would enhance the storytelling in games and enhance the technology in, in, in film um, and it's it's definitely uh, you know a, an awesome thing where at the end of the day again like uh, I think we're all after the same thing just having this really cool experience and this immersive experience and being able to share that with people is is really cool really fun um, and that is what third floor really prides itself on is really just clear compelling entertainment um, that we're all kind of after and uh, we definitely uh, love working with those uh, studios and uh, companies that are involved in these kind of projects. So um, 
it, it's just been a re very rewarding experience to work in both worlds. And um, for me personally, it's cool to see how they are just so interlinked um, in, a, in an awesome way. Um, if you want more information about the third floor, you can go to this website. Um, we're just about to wrap up here in a few minutes. I'll kind of open up for a couple questions, Q&A. Um, I guess there's a breakout room after. Uh, I believe it's S204, so uh, you can head over there if you want to kind of talk more in depth about any of this. But um, thank you so much, and I'll kind of open the floor for Q&A. had to do to make changes way later because of technical limits like for instance let's say uh, you have a reflection or something that is a very important part of the scene and then because of a game setting on PC configuration for instance you cannot have reflections and then it changes the meaning of that scene and you know it breaks the scene because you can't see the reflection or something like that some technical limitation that you met to you have you had to make changes for yeah, awesome. So the, the question was, I'm just kind of repeating this back for the camera here is, uh, you know, have we had to make changes later on uh, and kind of go back uh, to kind of reflect those changes? And a lot of the times in the, the previous process, they will weigh that decision based on whether, it, whether or not it's, it's worth it in their budget to do that. It might just get kicked down as a note to finals. That's usually the case. Um, but every once in a while, if, if it's really important for a screening or for approval, um, then yes, we would have to kind of go back, make that change. Um, sometimes it's painful where it's involving multiple things uh, that you know, would you know, not make sense if you're showing it uh, story-wise. So if like a character has a helmet on and now they don't have a helmet on because that was really crucial to the story. Again, it, if it makes sense for them to go back because it if, if it's not crucial to telling that story or they can do it later, it just makes more sense to kind of kick that down to a finals, um, you know, note. Um, hi there. Hi. Um, I was wondering uh, how much of a percentage of game engines are you using for doing uh, this production as opposed to traditional animation software? And secondarily, how much... Um, how much of a change are you seeing uh, with virtual production and sort of moving to a all pre-production? Are you still doing, you know, um, pre-visualization pre as much or are you sort of, how is that changing the dynamic? Yeah, so the question is kind of like the percentage of uh, virtual production being used now and um, kind of what the future, I guess, is how this is going to look and what we're kind of looking for. Um, it, I think the, our studio specifically is really, really uh, just happy about virtual production and that whole process and pipeline. Right now, it's very, unfortunately, it's very budget uh, de determined. So because it's, it, it, the, our, what we want to do as a studio is make uh, all real-time virtual kind of workflows work for the project. That's not always the case, and that it right now it involves I won't say um, twice the amount of work, but it sometimes is twice the amount of resources in a way. Um, for example, things that we could do we generally use Maya for our uh, streamline process of getting it in 3D, um, and uh, then we'll use the Unreal side mostly for the. Uh, virtual in the real time. Um, we, our goal is to combine the two in a way that is Maya's taking advantage of Maya's tools in the best way possible. Uh, most of the time it's with their, their animation tools and their um, kind of quick, easy viewport navigation. Um, and then taking advantage of all of Unreal's basically as a, a render engine. So um, all the lighting and the effects and 
and all of that would come out of it. So our, our ultimate goal is linking the two. Um, right now it's, again, project dependent. So if a project makes sense where this would iterate better in real time, um, there's some aspects that it needs to be and stay in real time uh, just because of interactive lighting and certain things that um, they want to choreograph. Um, uh, our, all, I think our ultimate goal is where we're moving definitely is going to be all just real time. Um, essentially that was kind of the goal of Viewport 2.0 in a way is uh, just having that uh, real-time viewport rendering work for us, but there's a lot of limitations to that. Uh, Unreal unlocks a lot of things for us to, to do, um, but also there's limitations on the Unreal side. So, But eventually that's where everything is going. I think every project in the previs, uh, our goal is to make that as efficient as if everything originally stayed in Maya, the old school way. Percentage-wise, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, it's probably like 50-50 on the amount of projects we're working on that involve Unreal. And Unreal has just been so awesome to team up with um, our kind of tech team and our uh, pipeline team. Uh, so a lot of the uh, proprietary tools that we're building in-house and that speak to Unreal and work with Unreal basically to make our pipeline just super efficient, that's uh, uh, you know, constantly changing, constantly changing, especially over the past two years. So, um, but absolutely, I think our goal as a company is to move 100% into uh, every project being real time and just being able to leverage, you know, the best of both worlds. Hello. Hi. Um, you mentioned a little bit about um, speaking with directors and the people who are sort of handling the story as well as like getting things approved. Um, how much and like how is that communication sort of structured? Is it like a few big meetings or are you able to sort of constantly send them, like you showed off the different versions you had of the shots and stuff like that? Are you able to sort of send them constant updates or is it like bigger meetings to just sort of get all the questions answered at once? So the question was kind of how the meetings kind of structured and how that kind of comes into uh, the whole kind of iterative process. Um, I think that a lot of a lot of the smaller um, projects will help with the meetings to be a little bit more intimate and free flowing. The bigger projects usually involve like a first major kickoff, and they give you as much information as possible. Um, and in a project like this uh, Apex, you know, Legends project, it was it's. It's not as large scale, so the teams are kind of smaller, which open you know the fact that you can communicate very quickly and have you know set up meetings very quickly. Um, most of the time, it's uh, usually uh, involved like a dailies, um, and if it's not a dailies, it's like a weeklies, like two two times a week is pretty common to kind of check in. But um, communication is constantly free flowing. Um, again, there's things that they're going to know information-wise that we might not know because of just it's not ready to uh, unleash basically into the story yet, and they don't want to like jump the gun and say things. Sometimes it's the opposite. They just give you a whole bunch of information, the story that's going to um, just be wild and crazy, and you're like, you know, this is a five-week schedule. This isn't going to happen. Um, and so you're basically kind of figuring out what you can do during that time and, and what's, what's feasible. Um, but the meetings are pretty regular. That's pretty common. Um, most of the time you're in direct communication with a, you know, a VFX supervisor or someone who's going to kind of handle the final side of things. Um, and it, it's pretty much on a daily basis. Um, same with the editor. The editor is like, probably the, the most important component to it who is like communicating and they probably have a direct line to the director as well. Um, on Apex Legends, I had a direct line to the director, so it wasn't that much of an issue to get information that I, that I needed. Um, the nice thing about the director too is he's very familiar with the 3D side of things, so I could explain things to him in a 3D world that made sense to him. Now, you don't get that all the time, uh, but he came from like a, a, a 3D background, so he knew lighting, he knew Maya, 
uh, which is, uh, you know, being able to speak that language is, is very kind of powerful, I guess. Um, you get directors that don't know that stuff and you have to uh, kind of figure out different language of how to explain that to them. Um, but it is uh, still the same uh, challenge as just being able to communicate clearly and uh, make sure that uh, you know, the, the idea that they're, or whatever kind of vision that they have is being executed on the creative side. Um, and so it's also our jobs to communicate back if something isn't going to quite work um, or if something isn't, you know, if they didn't, you know, if it's a challenge that they never even thought of is a like, cool idea, but it could just be very well a challenge that is like, this isn't quite how this is gonna work. And a lot of, a lot of the time is they'll see something on a, a storyboard or a concept artwork and that's not built from 3D. So it's just a 2D image and it's like, this is basically impossible to create. We can make this version because of the way the lensing and the angles of cameras actually work. Um, and uh, kind of propose those ideas or just in, take ideas and influence. But the communication is, again, really regular. You, if, you know, it's always encouraged to ask the questions of you know, what's coming you know, a lot sooner than later, um, so there's no surprises. Um, but it's, it's you know, just constantly being in communication. Um, for cinematics or um, game cutscenes specifically, um, do you prefer to start with storyboards and then move to animatics or start with a more defined concept art? Or do you just prefer to work based on the script and then assign shots to animators and then just iterate based from that? Cool. So yeah, the question is kind of like what kind of part of the phase or process do I like to start? Uh, with first, whether that be storyboards or concept art or just nothing blank canvas, um, it it really kind of depends if it's um, if it's a if it's a script that I was given or um, you know an idea that was given. Um, I if I am uh, very influenced by it and it's very uh, compelling and interesting and, and and honestly, if it's something that all of a sudden starts creating visuals in my head. I, I really love blank canvas. It's just like, this is what I see. Um, a lot of the time uh, that uh, if I'm giving given storyboards, uh, it, it helps to give me like, oh, this is this was the idea. This is the general idea. But you know, there's probably like nine times out of 10, um, the storyboards are good, they're working. Um, but there's always that, you know, 10% chance where it's just, you know, this isn't really that good a composition or you can tell it was just not, it was kind of an afterthought. Um, and so it, storyboards can actually deter you sometimes in being ultra creative because it's like, okay, this is what's being expected. So I got to do something like this. Um, a lot of the times if I'm seeing something, uh, an idea that's really awesome, really creative, um, I'll just quickly get the storyboard version out and here you go and then just go right into the alts and say, but we could do this and show them with each other. And uh, they really like that. I mean, a lot of the times the directors will uh, expect that from third floor because it's like this is, this is kind of uh, what we are known for. So um, you have some directors that uh, really know what they want. They, they want to execute this vision exactly. So they'll give us exactly what they want. This is a keyframe concept boom, just make that. And that's cool. Like sometimes it's like super cool uh, to start on that side of things because it's like this is literally the image that's coming out of the director's head and we just want to create that uh, shot in 3D now. Um, so I like to work, to answer the question, I like to work in all parts of the process. I prefer a blank canvas when it's something that I get inspired to do. And then if it's something that a director uh, his vision is really uh, powerful, then it's, uh, uh, it's really cool to kind of make that come to the real life or fruition there. Hi. Hello. Hi. Oh, it's pretty loud. Uh, thanks, uh, Mitch. It was a really cool presentation and really cool to hear about your process. Um, and I love that you brought up Seven, the opening titles as well. It's a personal favorite of mine. It's Kyle Cooper at his finest. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, I was wondering a bit about when you work with um, 
sort of cutscenes that happen in the game, so in between you know portions of gameplay. How much, um, if you worked on those scenarios, how much do you work with you know game director and narrative designers to kind of get the pacing in the cutscenes? You mentioned you know a lot of your work um, in in the edits and previous kind of getting the you know the right uh, balance. Uh, um, so do you kind of, you know, when there's proceeding things happening in gameplay, if there's, you know, a lot of action or, you know, a, a slower portion of gameplay, are you involved sort of with the, with the team of, you know, what sort of happens? Yeah, so the, the, the question was just like in more focus, I guess, like how uh, this, is, the, this process is involved more in-game and if I've been involved in that. Um, actually, not as much in-game. Um, I guess the closest to that was with Bungie's uh, Destiny, um, but it was it, it, the same way as you have a creative director at a final studio or a director at a um, you know big studio. Uh, there's like a you know game director that's directing the game. Uh, the same same ideas that uh, a director is like we want to be able to tell this in this story. Um, so I you know, would take that into just basically the closest, I think, like I said, was with a bungee, with a, with a prologue to, a, to uh, Bungie's Destiny. Um, so you, it was the, it's very similar, you know, you, the director has a vision and the director wants to actually have a, a certain idea in this prologue come out. And, um, you know, the, the, a lot of what you're showing in, the, in a prologue or uh, in-game is setting up the tone and setting up basically this um, this narrative that's going to happen. So you you know foreshadowing some things and um, maybe just hinting at uh, you know future in-game things that are coming. But it's it's like working the same way as if it was very similar to a, a cinematic. The cinematic may be a little bit more freedom and flexibility uh, because a lot of times. Uh, the game is in early development or you know super early stages of development where this promo or trailer or cinematic uh, really doesn't relate necessarily to, to gameplay and, they, and it gives you a lot more freedom because you're not locked into, well, this is not exactly what it's gonna look like in game, um, so it's cool. We can just move these buildings and do stuff over here. And um, so it's, it definitely offers more freedom and is not as, um, I guess, just structured in a way that it has to work and make sense in-game. In um, so I think that's the biggest difference. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you, um, when you are working with the uh, game studio, but uh, the one which is not using Unreal, but for example has his own uh, inside engine, do you find it in some way more challenging or it doesn't matter? In your Are you uh, saying uh, their own proprietary in-game engine? Yeah. <laughs> that is a awesome. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.